Welcome to the question and answer session of the 2020 Strickland Lectures. I'm glad that you're all here. Let me say right off the bat that this meeting is part of the series. So we are being recorded to post alongside the other videos. So if there's anyone in this group that's in witness protection, it might benefit you to stop your video at this point. Um, let me say we are grateful not only for Dr. Gaddy's willingness to do this live Q&A, but also for the very insightful and incisive lectures over the past few days. Thank you, Dr. Gaddy. Um, and I'd like to go over some ground rules. Uh, this is our first time trying this with this kind of technology. So if anything goes wrong, uh, we appreciate your patience. We're doing our best. Uh, how this is going to work, I'm gonna keep everybody on mute. If you have a question, please raise your hand, either physically or virtually. There's a raise hand button, uh, and I will call on you and unmute you. Um, so for the sake of order, please don't just unmute yourself and jump in. And that, that goes for follow-up questions too, or comments on what's being said. Uh, or if you're more comfortable writing your question down, you're welcome to do so in the chat feature. I'll keep an eye on that. Um, does anybody have any questions about this format before we open it up? All right, then let me open it up for questions. Greg, you're muted if you're trying to say something. You're gonna to have to unmute, there you go. Craig. Well, I, I had uh, asked a question, uh, I had submitted a question in advance and and, uh, and I guess more generally, Welton, I'd like for you to talk about the recent Supreme Court decisions that seem to have even further uh, diminished the wall of separation between church and state, particularly allowing uh, funding for uh, religious uh, schools, in uh, uh, that most recent case this past June, uh, you know, overturning a Montana Supreme Court decision. And then maybe also <laughs> comment upon uh, all of the religious groups that got uh, PPP loans from the, the CARES Act even you know the Roman Catholic Church or churches got over a billion dollars in PPP loans which are forgivable loans so you know it's just it's almost like an avalanche of colliding of, of, uh, of church and state and the state funding religion and I know that that's uh, really disappointing to you and to all of us, but just just comment uh, if you would. And Welton, before you start, let me say I'm realizing that I can mute you on this end, but I cannot unmute you. That's something that you have to do from your end. One moment. There you go. Okay. Okay. <clears throat> uh, I got to see the uh, questions that came in uh, last night or at least between last night and uh, and now and uh, I made uh, some notes on them just so uh, I, I would be more focused and not be uh, going on and on about it and Craig uh, yours was one of them and I'm going to start with the uh, the school uh, situation uh, I had at one time um, a lot of material that I wanted to talk about uh, related to schools because uh, the schools became really the ground on which everybody wanted to fight out what about they thought uh, related to religious freedom. Um, 
and I, I'll, I'll say this uh, before I answer the, the question, especially about the uh, Espinosa uh, Montana Department of Revenue uh, piece. Uh, it, it's interesting. I, in fact, I was telling Claire before uh, we, we went on the air, um, early on, all that I knew about religious freedom was about Catholic schools. And uh, people were being very uh, negative about Catholic schools because uh, they were, they had a good educational system going and they were always asking, and I, I remember here in Louisiana particularly, it started in uh, New Orleans, uh, people were asking uh, for money from the government in, in order to get buses to uh, bring kids to school and to uh, buy uh, books for uh, people in uh, the, these, these schools. And, and everybody was being critical uh, about them. And so they, they got a bad name. When that changed, two things were happening. One was integration. Uh, when integration came into the picture, uh, a lot of people who had been uh, putting down the uh, Catholic schools began to want to have schools of their own. And, and, and the second was, and it was a, a, a thing about money, um, when Baptist schools, I'll be very particular there because I knew them most, when Baptist schools got going was when Baptist churches had more people in them who had money to put into the offering plate and to let them have schools. They couldn't have done it before that. But no sooner did they start it than then they too began asking uh, if, if there was a way that they could get money like the Catholics got money, and it looked better for them than it did for Catholics because it was, of course, uh, them. All of that, those, those reasons, then started this rampage of wanting the uh, government uh, to fund education for all parochial schools and, and all private schools. What that did, uh, and, and, and if you've, you've read the, uh, uh, what some of the earliest people in this nation have said about the importance of public education, uh, our founders linked public education with our kind of government and said to have the kind of government, the kind of democracy that we needed, we needed to have public schools. Well, that all went aside. Uh, we had, and you all know uh, right here in, in Louisiana, some of the things that we saw, um, one close by where we are right now, uh, getting uh, $2 million uh, to start a school, and they didn't even have uh, room in the church to do uh, the worship service, much, much less uh, anything else. But they got the money. Uh, because of uh, the uh, person who was governor at that time. And uh, I'm, I'm not going to talk about that uh, because it goes too long. Um, so there has been since then th this rush to see who gets the money, how much money, what can we use it for, all of that. And uh, the, the earliest issues around financing uh, parochial schools was about um, race and about whether or not we can have a kind of, um, I've always called it a kind of glorified Sunday school uh, rather than just a real piece of education in which uh, kids were not getting um, told what to believe, but they were not getting told how to think. So 
what we're seeing in, in the question that uh, Craig brought up, uh, that it's called um, the Espinosa Montana Department of Revenue case, the uh, Supreme Court ruled on. And, and what happened was, though the state uh, constitution of Montana bars using tax money for religious purposes, uh, the state of Montana passed a special income tax credit program in 2015 to help fund nonprofit scholarship organizations and, and supposedly to help low income families uh, pay for private schools. Well, of course, that went contradictory to the, uh, the Montana uh, what they have always had in their constitution. Um, and so the Supreme Court went with them on that. Now, what do I think about that? I think it is terrible because it goes contradictory, directly contradictory uh, to what our United States Constitution uh, has to say. It, it, is a, it is a corruption of the foundation of the, the whole principle of church-state separation. In fact, this overturned decades of uh, precedent uh, in order to use tax money for private schools because religious schools are now and, and will be in the future, according to what uh, I'm seeing, uh, religious schools are the epicenter of uh, religious influence on the next generation in, in people's minds. So it's imperative that the members of the faith support uh, those schools, not the taxpayers at large. Uh, public school dollars should fund public schools which educate 90% of our nation's students. But we're seeing more and more, and, and that what happened in uh, in Montana has already happened in about 15 or 16 other uh, states. And um, the more our nation has moved toward um, a blending of religion and politics, and Congress especially have, uh, have become very interested in that, we have seen more openness to bringing uh, public tax dollars into uh, private education and into other forms <clears throat> of that. Craig mentioned uh, the uh, in, endemic pandemic and, and what happened there. What happened there is the same thing that happened in the, uh, uh, the money that we have been distributing after hurricanes. Uh, but that money is now going straight from the uh, government tax dollars into the hands of all kinds of religious uh, institutions that are helping people who really need help uh, after uh, these storms, uh, but not, don't need to be getting them uh, in that way. Thank you, Weldon. Uh, I'm going to leave you unmuted, um, so we won't have to. That's ask. good. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, does anybody else have a question? Yes. You're still muted. There you go. Oh, um. Welton, will you be posting the transcripts of these lectures somewhere online? Because I like to re—I like to read or reread. I yeah, we. Um, the, I've been asked about that, and I'm 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 pleased to share them. Uh, I think what we'll do is um, uh, we haven't talked about it, but I, I think we will give people a chance to say they want them. Uh, because they, uh, I don't want to give them to people that are just going to throw them away, but I, I know you and I know you'll read them and 
so we'll we'll make a way for people to say we'd like to have that and uh, and get them to you. Yes, yeah. if you'd like to have a copy, uh, you can email me at zach at northmen.org. Uh, and the, the email addresses are on the website. We're having issues with the office manager's email address right now, but I'm getting mine. And we'll, we'll send those to you. Yeah. Other questions? We had one question or a few questions come in online. Uh, and let me share one of those. Um, pull up my notes. So we received this question from a pastor serving in Seattle. And she writes, as a pastor, I often wonder how to define political and where to draw lines. For example, a former church member was a lobbyist for the League of Women Voters, and he often had lots of political signs to give out. However, he would never talk directly about a candidate on church property, so he'd drive off property onto the street, open his trunk, and share resources with church members there. Could you comment on where those lines ought to be drawn? Yeah, let me just uh, do the bottom line first. Uh, where should it be, the line should be drawn? I, I think the line uh, should be drawn at partisanship and at name calling. Uh, now, let me, having said that, also observe that politics is a good word. Nothing wrong with it. Politics uh, describes uh, how we make decisions and how we govern each other, not just in uh, the United States government, but in churches and in all kinds of, of institutions. So I, I don't want to put down politics. Everybody has politics in their lives. Churches have a responsibility, and I, I talked about it some in the lecture uh, today. They have a, <clears throat> a responsibility to address values, the values that are a part of our belief, um, and they have a responsibility to relate those values to issues and to public policies and to what's happening uh, in, in all parts of uh, the world in, in which we live. So I think if you say the church ought not get political, that's, that's not good. A church does need to be political in, in the sense that it is telling people Here's what our beliefs are about. Here are the values that we live by. And we're trying to talk about how to make all of that come into reality in our churches, in our schools, in our government, in, in all of that. Now, the, the, the whole business of partisanship um, has messed up everything. Um, I, 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 you probably know this, I didn't for a long time, but the founders of our nation uh, wanted at one time to say, we will never have political parties. They, they wanted to ban them. Uh, it didn't end up that way. But there are many days I wish they had uh, because the, the partisanship is not now something that enhances our government. It's something that brings it to a halt, uh, something that is dividing the, the nation. And so when we talk about politics in the sense that we are with, with this question, politics ought to be talked about in the church, ought to be talked about in other places, but not in the way of doing it with partisanship. In an election year, and I'm not going to repeat what uh, I've already said uh, in, in the lecture today, but in an election year, we have to be very, very careful 
about whether we're talking about politics generally or whether we're talking about partisanship specifically. And in the church or in any house of worship, uh, knowing the distinction between those two it is absolutely a necessity. Um, th there are all kinds of ways, and, and you heard some of them today, uh, in which to uh, say this is the candidate I, I want to uh, support. Uh, if you do that outside the building, outside uh, the, the community of, of the church, um, in order to do that, and you, you're fine. Uh, if, if you do it within the church uh, itself, uh, then you're going to lose your IRS status. And, uh, and it, for some reason, people really back off from that pretty quickly when they learn that that's uh, what's at issue. Uh, personally, and, and I, I want to underscore personally, uh, because others don't do it this way, and I respect them even though I don't do it the way they do. Uh, personally, I have always stayed away from uh, partisan words, names, parties, uh, bumper stickers, uh, something in the yard. I, I don't even put uh, Jesus in the yard uh, like some people are doing. Um, I, I never, though, stay away from enabling church members to view highly political issues from a moral perspective. I think we're not doing our job as ministers if we are silent uh, at that point. And uh, I got just a, a little bit close to this today. Uh, there was a lot more to say about it. I really wish that churches, and, and a, ch a church like ours can do it. Um, I wish that churches would learn to talk about the tough issues that we divide on and learn how in the relationships that we have in the church, let them help us talk realistically, kindly, about where we ought to be going politically. Uh, now that goes way beyond what the question was, but I think it's something very important. Thank you, Welton. That's, um... I, I'll admit I I did not know uh, what the, the the fact about the founding fathers not wanting us to have political system or you know two partisan systems, um, and I think it's it's fascinating. It's hard for me to even imagine um, how this system works without that. Um, let me so let me uh, draw attention to uh, Cooper Doyle uh, posted a question in the chat a few moments ago. Uh, and he asked you, Dr. Gaddy, have you studied the relationship between the church and the state in the Republic of Ireland at all? Can you speak to that? Uh, not enough to, um, to, to talk about it in a helpful way. I, I mean, I certainly am uh, aware of the divisiveness uh, of that in, in Ireland, and I've, I've watched as a uh, various leaders uh, there come and go trying to uh, to see that uh, Ireland is put back together again uh, but I'm sorry I, I don't know enough about it to uh, to speak uh, that would teach you anything thank you thank you Cooper for the question are there others that want to ask a question before I move on to another pre-submitted question Another uh, pastor wrote in online and it said, um, how do you see the no religious test rule playing out with regard to the nomination of Amy Coney Barrett to the Supreme Court? Why does it remain important to maintain this rule even in this case, especially since it's so abundantly clear 
Her nomination may have been driven by support for one particular religious perspective. I'm, I'm not surprised that that question would, would come up uh, at, at some point today or, or sometime uh, during this, uh, this weekend. Um, well, let me say two things, and they're going to sound a, a little bit contradictory at first. Uh, I, I very much favor the no religious test uh, when speaking about government officials, and, and that's what that one is about. It's about government officials. It's not about what, you, what kind of people you're uh, hiring in your business. Um, at the same time I say that, I, I speak strongly about the secular nature of our government. Uh, if, if we don't start at the bottom line knowing that this is a secular nation, not a religious nation or a spiritual nation, uh, we're off to something that puts us down the way uh, that will take us away from the democracy we have. Uh, not all Catholics uh, condemn a, a woman's rights uh, about birth control, about pregnancy, uh, about other women's issues. Um, and that's why I would not set aside the, the no religious test just for that issue uh, in, in the questioning that's going on uh, re regarding uh, uh, the uh, candidate. I, 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 want, I will we'll go back for a moment to something that was in the lecture today. Uh, I, I find President John F. Kennedy as a model uh, with which those two realities, secular government and uh, no religious test, uh, two realities that would help us understand how best uh, to make use of that. I, I, would, I would have much preferred uh, Judge Barrett uh, to be honest in the Senate's hearings, uh, open in those hearings rather than refusing to express her convictions. I, I think it would have been a, a, a great moment if she would have just said, look, here's what I believe. I, I am a Catholic. I, I have made these promises. I, I've, I've done this out of my own devotion. And um, I, I would... Uh, I would have had more respect if she had said that, and then talk about how she would handle uh, Roe v. Wade or, or, or any of the other conflicts that she may face uh, related to uh, women's bodies and health. And uh, the, the reason that I, I brought uh, uh, the president into it is because, you know, he said, if I ever am in a situation where my religious-based morals conflict with my fidelity to the Constitution of the United States, I will resign the office. Now, she wouldn't have to say, I will resign the office. She could say, I promise you, if I get in that situation, I will recuse myself and, and let the other people on the court make that decision. But we didn't get any of that. I do think, as I'm saying, I do think there is a way to handle that, um, but you gotta be uh, sensitive. Uh, you've got to be uh, hard, uh, hardcore committed to religious freedom in order to do that even uh, among the nine justices in the court. Which is an increasingly big ask. Yeah, yes, it is. Uh, while we were talking about that, we got a question from uh, Patricia Strickland. She asked, uh, so you mentioned, uh, you know, anybody is welcome to endorse a candidate, a partisan candidate from the pulpit. All they have to do is give up their 501c designation. 
she asks, have there been any recent instances of the DOJ actually pulling anyone's 501c designation? You know, I don't know the, um, I, I don't know when the last one was. Um, I've been in, uh, we, we worked uh, at, at Interfaith Alliance, we worked carefully with the IRS because uh, we put out materials uh, to houses of worship and also to candidates uh, to uh, help them know how to stay out of trouble uh, with that. Uh, the last the, the last one I remember was uh, in the second uh, second election of um, let me see I, I, well I, I'm, I'm blank on it. I know that it's it's probably before 2000, the last one that, that did this. In the uh, hearings that I've talked with uh, in Congress, we've always had IRS people there. And, uh, and what they say is, we don't have enough people in the IRS dedicated to uh, finding where those things are happening and how we have enough time uh, to, to, to really do something about it. Uh, in the, um, in the, I think in the W, uh, second term, there was, there was a one group in California, uh, that was charged with, uh, being using the pulpit for, uh, uh, trying to get one person elected. Uh, but they never brought that, uh, they, they did investigate it, uh, but they never brought it to term and said that there wasn't enough uh, information to do that. Uh, and and I, I think the, that we have to have, uh, we have to, if we're going to stay with that, and I certainly hope we do, uh, if we're going to really show how you penalize someone to it, for it, uh, you, you, we've got to have more people working on it. Yeah, this is a this is a. I shouldn't mention this. This is a major plot point in uh, the movie God's Not Dead Two. If you ever want to see it handled really poorly, uh, it's an awful movie. I don't recommend anybody watch it. Um, but it's it's this it's playing on this uh, on what you're saying. Well, in the 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 lack of enforcement. Uh, it's a group of yeah. pastors saying, we're going to do it and who's going to call us on it. Um, yeah. And of course, watching the movie, you're supposed to cheer them on. Uh, <laughs> that's embarrassing to say. I watched it kind of by accident. Don't, don't. I was going to say, tell me why you watched it. <laughs> <laughs> I was doing opposition research <laughs> for a sermon I was doing. Um, um, let's see. Uh, anyone else have a, a, a question before I move on to the next one? Yes, Julia Strickland. Um, so you talked yesterday and a little bit today about how people are trying to change the definition of religious freedom and how you think that's not a good idea, but yes. is there anything that you would add to it or any, like any positive changes you see that can be made? That, that's a good question. Uh, and, and there's, I, I guess you're going to see uh, in my answer uh, a little bit of my stubbornness about the Constitution, uh, because every time that we have seen someone try to change the religious freedom definition, uh, we have gone away from uh, that uh, r religious freedom as the, the Congress sees it in our Constitution and, and otherwise. And um, and I'm. I'm I'd be willing if if you've got an, an idea about that. I'd love to hear uh, what what one of those would be because I really don't understand it. Uh, the um, and and when you see what's wanting, what people are wanting to change, it, it becomes not uh, an issue of religious freedom. It becomes an issue of really. Free, uh, really having religion over non-religion, not because that's one of the major things 
uh, that, that, that they want to do. And in, um, there, there is a, a real effort to say that if, if we are living within our religion, uh, we ought not ever be persecuted by our country by giving us a penalty for doing something that's all right in our religion. Uh, but, and, and, and I have to say this too, that works more, that, that kind of argument works more if you're a Christian. If you're a member of another uh, religion, uh, then you, you'll be ousted on it for uh, even suggesting it. Thank you, Julia. Let me, uh, let me ask another question that was submitted online. Um, with concentrated efforts in the court, uh, we've been talking about uh, Amy Coney Barrett, with concentrated efforts in the court to bring a challenge to Roe versus Wade in the near future, how do you perceive the role of religious liberty in the conversation around reproductive rights? One of the reasons uh, that I, I didn't talk about Roe v. Wade in uh, any of the issues. I, I referred to them, but didn't talk about them. And uh, it, it was because it, it, we have heard so much uh, about it in the news and, and in uh, all other kinds of places as well. Um, I personally see uh, Roe v. Wade as a religious freedom issue. Um, because most of the debates about why we ought to change it uh, go around someone's religion. And um, so, yes, I, I think it is definitely a religious freedom issue. At the same time, I, I think it is much more than that. And even if we could come to uh, some cooperation or uh, at least guiding each other through this thing without killing each other or trying to hurt each other. Um, we, we've got to talk about it's a women's issue. And, and it does make a difference that it's a women's issue. Uh, I can't say anything about some things about that. It is a medical issue. It is a life and death issue for the mother as well as, as the child. And I would even say um, it is a humanitarian issue across the board. And so my hope would be that if the high court does uh, go after this again and say we're going to take another look at it. Uh, I hope for goodness sakes it will be a religious freedom issue, but I, I won't hope it's these other issues as well so that we're not doing something that hurts a whole lot of people uh, because that didn't even get talked about. And, and of course, in the uh, in the religious freedom issue, you absolutely have to at some point say it is because some religions believe this and some religions believe this, and the Constitution says that we are not to be as a government we are not to be saying whose beliefs are right and whose beliefs are wrong. And um, I, that's, that's all I can say about that. I, I do cer certainly believe it's a religious freedom issue, but um, I'm not a woman. And there's a heck of a lot more stuff going on there uh, that needs to be talked about. I, I hear you saying, you know, I've as far as what you what you can speak to, that this is at the core of, of issue of religious liberty, and I'm reminded of a conversation I had with a former leader of a, a Planned Parenthood chapter in Texas, 
um, and we were having a conversation about this uh, and you know just the, the the ethical or moral you know aspects to it. Uh, and she replied and she said, w stop, whose who's ethics, whom, whose morals are we talking about? Are we talking about this yeah. Jewish understanding of first breath? Are we talking about this you know, religion's understanding of uh, the quickening, the first time you feel it move or conception? So uh, I hear you that at, at its core, it is a question of which religious uh, morality is, is getting a preference. And you know, and th this often doesn't come up often, but there have been a lot of times when I've been in a conversation like that, and I have to say, whose God are we talking about? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me ask, uh, when we were recording the first lecture, we were talking afterwards, and you said uh, that the far-right fundamentalist church where you grew up preached religious freedom almost as much as it preached substitutionary atonement. Uh, let me ask, why was that so important at the time? And why would that community or a similar community disregard it so easily today? I, I'm really glad that, uh, that you asked that. Um, Baptists came out of a very reactionary religious identity early on. Uh, was extremely strong on freedom in, in all ways. We talk about uh, the priesthood of the believer. We talk about um, anti-state church, which all of those people had experienced very negatively. Uh, we talk about um, uh, the free church tradition. We talk about the independence of every congregation. Um, that, that's who Baptists have been. And so the, the very idea of the state uh, having much to say about uh, religious freedom is, it was just, it was off the table. It, it wasn't there. It, it just wouldn't be there. And, and early on, um, we came from that part of uh, the, the, the thought of there were, there were questions as to whether we ought to uh, have a Pledge of Allegiance, a, a question as, as to whether or not we ought to have a, a, a flag. Uh, all of that, I mean, those, that was early Baptists, and they didn't want to taint uh, what they were doing uh, in the name of freedom and in the name of uh, of religion, so that that fit perfectly into the congregation that I was in, and um, and and so I, I mean we we learned in those sections uh, and sessions at at, at night. Uh, we we had a good course in in religious freedom because that was. A, a, it was a sacred part uh, of our church. What happened? We um, politicized religion. And uh, when we politicized religion, then we started uh, having questions about, okay, what kind of freedom and uh, who's free to do this and who's not free to do this. and. And, and all of those things. And then we got in the, uh, uh, the, the whole rush to say, well, our, our, our party's uh, more Christian than your party, or uh, you're, you're being too good to Jews, or, you know, all, all of those kind, kind of things. And so, as oddly as it seems, and, and honestly, and this, I don't know that I've ever said this out loud, I found it. Um, I found it surprising, really surprising, that the the more uh, Baptist, particularly, uh, the the more they were politicized, the more I was surprised because I never thought they would do that. And 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 honestly. Uh, and I guess I'm trying, and I hope this is right. Um, I know a lot of people in the Baptist church who had pastors 
that led them down that line uh, to saying, look, this is really about religion. It's really about Christianity because we're trying to take, we're trying to make this nation more Christian uh, than anybody else. And then under that, they also knew how uh, to talk about politics and it, it became a very political question rather than a religious question. I hear this, this uh, on one level that um, there was this sense of, of protecting ourselves. We, you know, we will not be controlled by the state. But then, as you said, when it became politicized, it felt like we had the opportunity to control the state. And that was more alluring. We were more willing to give up that, that freedom. Um, because well, we and as, I, as I said, Zach, in the in the in the first of of the lectures, uh, if if you tell someone, okay, we're in a, a very unstable uh, place in in our nation right now, uh, and we need some some guidance, um, if if you have someone come forward that says, look, uh, if, if we can get ourselves together here and we can make this the kind of Christian nation it ought to be, uh, we're in charge and we'll, and we'll, we'll be all right. Uh, the, 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 the major problem with all of that was, uh, because I, I it, it wasn't that I studied the religious right. I had dinner with them all time. I lived with them. They were my friends. And what I knew was that the people who were trying to build the religious right were already as political as they were religious. They knew how to use religious language. They, they knew where to go. They knew how to put churches together. They knew what people would follow. And, um, and they sold it. Uh, and then they did exactly what uh, they intended to do because if, if you'll look back, uh, then look at the number of people on the religious right who ran uh, for the presidency or ran for major offices uh, all across the nation. Thank you. Uh, before I ask another question, let me ask again if anybody, if that sparked anything that anybody wants to ask about here. Joanne? Welton, what was yes. their understanding of the Gospels? <laughs> I, I'm sorry, I'm laughing about that, but but, but the Gospels weren't in it. <laughs> the, the, uh, it. It was about it, it was about the institutional church and institutions, and how we save our institutions. Well, even more, how we take over our institutions, and as we take over our institutions, then. We can also take over our churches. And once you sell that, and, and if, if, you're a, if you're a pastor selling it and you want to be in a church where uh, you're the only voice that anybody is supposed to listen to, it sounds pretty good. Uh, and and that, was, that was certainly a, a lot of it. I'll say... Um... As, as one who grew up in an uh, unabashedly uh, partisan church, uh, Southern Baptist Church, um, it was a revelation to me that the Gospels had any implications at all besides who was in charge. Um, and that was in college, I think, that I, I, I realized that. And that was largely thanks to Claire. So we can thank Claire for that. Um, but I, I, that's, I think that question cuts to the heart of it, um, that, that they did not, 
consider so much the content of the gospel, the teachings of Jesus. It was not about grace or love or humility. It was about who was in charge and how we can wield this so that we can say God is in charge and God is a code for us and our ideas. Well, I've heard you say before, I've never met anybody who wanted a theocracy who didn't also want to be Theo. Yeah, that's right. Um, that's right. Yeah. Other questions? Let me ask this one. Uh, you mentioned off camera after we uh, filmed today's lecture um, that if you'd had time to speak to the state of religious liberty um, in other arenas, you would have, have taken time to speak to uh, religious liberty in the military. Uh, could you elaborate more on what you might have said if you'd had more time and space in that lecture? Hmm. Well, I, I think it's what I will say here uh, is somewhat surprising. It was surprising uh, to me. Uh, there are numerous religious freedom issues that um, uh, exist in the United States uh, military academies and, and even on battlefields. Um, I uh, have, have done a lot of work with the Pentagon and uh, with people in various places uh, uh, in the military, uh, because it, it is what's happening. Uh, there are real conflicts uh, within the military itself over religion, and they don't want that, uh, of course, any more than, than any of the rest of us. Uh, I, I remember um, one time working with the Pentagon on some uh, papers uh, in which they were they were trying to uh, be sure that they were using language that would not be uh, offending to anyone, but would be helpful in understanding the role of religion in the military and, and in people's lives. Um, and uh, they came out with a wonderful uh, piece of paper. Uh, I was, after I had helped them, I left and I didn't see, uh, see them for the, the people I'd worked with for some time. And uh, maybe six months later or so, I said, well, how did it go? Did, is it all in place? And they said, no, uh, it, it, it's not all in place. It all got changed because uh, it got to a higher officer in the Pentagon um, who uh, wanted his religion to be the dominant religion in the military. Um, and so he changed it all and uh, changed the, uh, uh, the, the, what we had decided about the, the wording of it as well as uh, of, of what else. Um, I, uh, the, the Air Force Academy ha has been one of the real challenges uh, in, in dealing with religious freedom. Uh, I, the commander of the Air Force Academy invited me to come out there and talk with him about uh, issues uh, for which they were being criticized. And, and they were being criticized uh, su superbly and also they, they should have been. Um, what was happening, uh, one of the things that was happening was high-ranking officers uh, who always uh, walked around uh, on the campus uh, with all of their uh, their best looking stuff to say, I am the biggest thing you're ever going to be around. Those kind of people uh, were going to students that were coming to the Air Force Academy and, and were stopping them uh, at, on the campus and saying, you know what, what is your religion? And they'd talk and, and, and when they were talking to these kind of people, they were talking to people who were scared to death because they were talking to a, a higher officer. And, uh, and they'd say, you know, you need to be saved. Now, th th there were a lot of uh, very, very right wing organizations right down from the campus of uh, the Air Force Academy. And so 
when a, when a general tells a cadet that he or she needs to become a Christian, the rank and authority of the official prevails. And the, the student says, yes. Now, they may have said it to get them to go away, or they may have said it because something really happened there. Similar events uh, occurred after I had went there. I went to West Point. I went to the Naval Academy, and they were having all of these same uh, problems. Uh, there are critical misuses of religion on the battlefields. I, I remember uh, talking with a, a high officer at the Pentagon and, and saying, you, you, you simply can't do or you don't need to be doing what you're doing. They were printing uh, Christian Bible verses on the guns that were being used in conflict by soldiers from multiple religions or no religion at all. Horrible results came in Iraq, in Iraq, uh, from a Sunday in Iraq when evangelicals in an armed truck drove through groups of Muslims with a sign shining and a music blaring the words, Jesus killed Muhammad. Uh, imagine that. You know, I'll, I'll, I could go on and on, but I'm not going to. I, I'll tell you one other thing because it helped me understand uh, some of the things that I was running into uh, I was invited to Yale uh, to meet for three or four days with uh, a groups of high-ranking chaplains, and, and they were from every branch uh, of the military. And I think, in, in fact, uh, the, they were the highest officers uh, in every branch except the Marines. Uh, in our conversations, as we got to trust each other, uh, they got very honest, these leaders did. They said, without equivocation or disagreement, they said, what's wrong with us is the generals and their superiors in the, in the hierarchy do not know what religious freedom is. And so they're the officers they call the shots, they do this, they never even bounce it off of the Constitution because they are the Constitution. Uh, and, and so it, it still goes on. I mean, it goes on in, in the, every branch, I think. I think sometimes we've made uh, progress in it, uh, but, I, but I have to tell you, it, uh, it divides people in the military uh, situations, and that in itself is enough, uh, even more as, as we see it, uh, what it's doing uh, about the nature of integrity and religion, and, and that's more important. Thank you, Welton. Uh, I'm keeping an eye on the clock, and I see that we're we're past five, so I'm going to ask us to wrap it up. Um, well, that's all I know already, anyway. So. <laughs> well, what are you going to talk about tomorrow morning? <laughs> ah, you got to watch that one. <laughs> uh, I want to invite you all back uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, as prelude start at 10:45, of course. You know, uh, worship starts at 11, and Dr. Gaddy will be presenting the final address um, in this lecture series tomorrow morning in the context of worship. Thank you, Dr. Gaddy, for being here. Thank all of you for your questions. Uh, and I will talk to you tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you. Have a good night. <laughs>